Hello guys, welcome back to the Beastie Room. Today we are going to um, take a look at a spider that we've not shown on the channel as of yet. So today it's going to be its uh, first day out as it were. And it is in fact the Pamphobetus petersi. Now, within the hobby, there's a little bit of confusion about identifying some of these um, Pamphobetus species. And because of, this is because many of them look very much alike. Now we know for a fact now we've had these checked out. These were actually bred by my very good friend, uh, Stephen Bass. He managed to breed these. And after a little bit of checking out, we've also um, sent some to Rad at uh, Creatures of the North. And he's had them checked out and we can confirm these are true petersi, which is a really, really amazing thing. It's a really, really cool thing. And it's one of the reasons why we strive to make sure that when we're breeding our spiders, we are actually putting the same spiders together because it's very, very important that we keep these pure lines going. Now with these petersi, there, there isn't, or there hasn't been many bred at all. Um, I think it was back in 2016, 16 or 17 I think somewhere around there that these were last bred and I think they were bred in Europe and um, I say my friend Stevie managed to get hold of some and he's grown them on and we've got these youngsters now so these are the pure thing the real McCoy as it were now what we done was we kept them in these um, 520 mil tamper proof pots this is how I done mine uh, Steve done his a slightly different way because um, we would like to compare um, notes and see which works best and what does you know what does what, and I found these worked really really well. And all we done was put a little bit of um, soil in the bottom, a little bit of substrate. We put a piece of um, bark in there as well. And as you can see, these guys have burrowed down and they get underneath the bark. Now, without a doubt, all of these have actually burrowed down and gone right to the very bottom. So they're acting very much like a fossorial spider, which many of our slings do. Even our arboreal slings act as, uh, act as fossorial when they're babies. And that's, these have been no different. They've done exactly the same thing. Now, the reason I opted for the deli pot, you know, these tamper-proof pots, is because they give us a small floor space. So when these guys were tiny, they didn't have all that space, but they also had a little bit of height here, which made it easier for me to be able to deal with them because these can be very quick and they can decide just to tear off out at a moment's notice. So getting them from here into one of these um, bra plast tubs is probably gonna be amusing if nothing else. So we're gonna set them up in a really simple way. All we're gonna do is have a little bit of soil in the bottom, potting compost, nothing special. Because all we're doing, as you lot would have realised by now, we keep things very, very simple in the growing on stages. And this is because they don't need to have um, anything much really. They, they just don't need a lot. And it's more important that we can grow them on and monitor them perfectly well without having a fight with putting them in enclosures where they've got lots of places to disappear and hide and things like that. So we keep them nice and simple, just really to make our lives simple. So we're gonna put a little bit, a little bit of substrate in there. Don't need a huge amount. As I say, this is just normal potting compost as well. Nice and simple. Then we're just gonna get a nice, easy little piece of bark that we can pop in there as well. This is just to give them a little somewhere to hide should they feel the need. One thing we've noticed um, with other Pamphobetus that we've reared up, things like the Machala, the Nigricolor, Costas, they, these guys, when, when we've put them into bigger enclosures, rather than hiding underneath the bark, nine times out of 10, they are out and about and they like to sit on top of it. So it completely changes the way they're behaving. When they were very small, they all hid away. Um, although saying that, when these are up on the shelf, quite often they're sitting out on top. So we're gonna, um, we've given them the option. They've got a little bit of choice now. 
We're going to put our trusty water bowls in here. Courtesy of the milkman. There we go. So we're going to put them in there. And we're going to fill them up. Now, one of the things that we'll find with the panther beaters is there seems to be a little bit of um, cross information as to how much these guys require in humidity. Now, I've been experimenting with ours and with these slings, we've kept them relatively dry. Um, once a week, I will moisten down the substrate a little bit. Not a lot, just a, just a tiny bit, because you'll notice also in these pots, they've got no water bowls. So they're actually going up the stage now where we can give them a water bowl. In the early stages, I let them rely on their food. Um, and also we can spray a bit of water on the edge of the, the pot there, and they will drink off of that if they need it. So in terms of humidity, I've kept these slightly on the dry side and they've done really, really well. We have got adults that we keep dry and we've got adults that we keep in a much more humid environment. And so far, I've not noticed any differences as to how they're behaving. Now, um, the problem with that is probably is the fact that we found that our adults especially can pretty much, um, what's the word? Um, they can adjust to almost any sort of scenario, a bit like things like the salmon pink. They've got this wide range of ability where they can actually cope with it dry and cope with it um, in the damp as well. So we're still trying to nail down the very, very best ways of keeping them. So I would suggest somewhere in the middle. You know, we're probably looking at around about 65 to 70% humidity. No more than that, really. Then, then don't, they don't really need it any more than that. So um, 60, 60 to 70 percent, I would say, you should be fine. You should be OK. Um, so what we're going to do, we are now going to try and get these into these. So what we'll do is we'll start with this one here. We'll get our lid. And we're going to see how this works. So what we'll do is we'll put that up to that edge. That gives us a little bit of an edge there. And we're going to put our lid halfway like that. And then we're going to get our tub, get our paintbrush. And what we're going to do now is we are going to tip this over. And hopefully, what we'll do, we'll tell you what, we'll squeeze the, close the gap up there. If he bolts anywhere else, he's going to land in one of the other tubs. So that would be a bonus. Now these guys are quite flighty. Here he comes. You see how quick they move? They just dart. There we go. Nice and gently. I'm going to try and make... Oh, there you go. You see how fast that was? He was literally in, in an instant. Now what we can do now is we try and take this top off so you get a good look at him. You see him there? Very, very pretty spider. This one, in actual fact, is coming up to molt. Oh, you got your so he's actually coming up to molt. And we can tell this by the light brown colouring. Now, another interesting thing with these guys as well. These guys do not get disturbed at all in these pots. Only once a week when we come round to feed them and, uh, and check them. But you'll see there, he's actually got a bit of a bald bum. Now this isn't due to stress because he just doesn't actually get any. So it's very, very interesting how he's flicked his bum up. He's flicked the hairs off there. Is that because he's been not coming up to mold? It's, it's possible, yeah. It's a very good question. That's a very good point. He is, and we can see by the colour in here. He's very, very pale, this pale brown. And you'll find all of the panther beaters, most of them are really dark, black, chocolate brown, when they're, um, when they're freshly malted. But as they're coming into a malt, they go this brown color. It's like a beige. Yeah, it's like a beige, it is. 
very, very pretty. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna put the lid on this guy and hopefully we'll have another one that isn't at the same stage. And maybe we can get to see a little bit of the color differences within them. Right, so that's one. That went well, didn't it? That was good. Don't forget, take off your label so that you know who's who. We'll put that on there. Mr. Peter Sai. Right then, put this over here. We're gonna go for another one. Let's do our label first. Back with our lid again. And you can see the advantage of putting the lid halfway across like this. It means that our spider can go in here and generally they will want to bolt the full length until they hit something. So at least with this here, it can bolt in there. It's not gonna come clean out straight away. So it just gives you a few seconds longer, a little bit extra time in which to react or do whatever it is you need to do. So we're gonna, now this one actually, this one looks darker. So maybe, just maybe, you notice we're using the the, uh, the wooden end of the paintbrush as well, and this is because we're going down into the soil. It doesn't make any difference, but it's it just stops all the um, brushes getting squeezed up. Now we've got to be careful now because this bit of bit of um, oh, look at that. You see, this one does not like being uncovered. We don't want that falling out. So here he comes. You get a nice view of him there, and you can see there how much darker he is. So this one has molted out recently, and you can see, look at that, see, look at that, just buried himself immediately. So we're just going to turn it around, being careful that that bit of bark don't fall out. You see that, look, quite incredible. What I'm going to do is I'm going to remove this because I don't want it falling on him. You see, they're giving it the typical ostrich scenario. If I can't see him, he can't see me. Well, that don't quite work, Mr. Spider. Here we are. All right then. Let's see if we can, you know, a little flick of his bum there. He's trying to flick them hairs. Oh, he's in. Now then. Now as we were saying, you can see with this one, this is fairly, fairly newly um, malted out. And you can see that by the difference in the colour. He's really dark. You notice also there he's got the red hairs on, on the abdomen there. Really show up nicely. Absolutely fantastic. So this guy here, hasn't long molted. Now if you were in any kind of rush as to actually sex your spiders, we have five of these here. Um, and now is the time that I will try and get a molt that I can actually um, have a look at and see if we can work out the sex of that spider. Um, when they're smaller, we can get them when they're smaller and they're still in these pots, but it can be done. Um, but I tend to wait until we get move up to this stage and then we will sex them and then depending on what sex they are will depend on what we do in terms of feeding and um, everything else. So once we know that we've got males, because these are all siblings, we can slow our males down and we can make them move and grow much, much slower. And then that way they'll be ready for when, um, when we want to breed. Because as you all know, the males tend to mature much quicker than females. So it's very important that we, um, we monitor what they are. But up until this stage now, we've had plenty of time. There's, there's no need to worry about them until they get to this stage. All right, so that was cool. We've seen actually two different color variations there. And this is all purely down to the malt. So we've got another one in here. 
as you can see they're very nervous spiders now this one is again this is closer to a malt see the difference there more of the brown color you can see that nice and clearly you can see this one's got a nice clean bum as well so he's obviously the last two this one and the last one have not been such nervous spiders the very first spider we saw appears to be quite a nervous one right let's see if we can get him in we want him to come backwards so we're just going to go down in front of him we're only just touching the very tips of his feet with his pedipalps there you see how they literally just jump there we go look at that now you can see that one's got a little bit of a little bit of hair kicking going on there you see how they hold their abdomens up it's almost like they're trying to make themselves look much much bigger and it's also what this is doing if we were to persist and harass this spider he will kick up the hairs from the abdomen all them urticating hairs so his abdomen is already the highest point of the spider and by doing that he's making them go more airborne it's easier for him to kick them up into the air and then hopefully they will float around in the atmosphere get in the eyes of whatever it is that's harassing him and uh, give him a chance to scurry off and disappear very very pretty spiders and these guys will only get better with age so as they grow they just improve all of the time and they are quite quick growers as well so um, if you do like your panther beaters they're they are a fast spider right we're going to put this one here all right then let's get our label again now oh, this one's up ready for malt as well now this is an interesting point actually it's worth mentioning and something that we notice a lot with our slings and things with our adult spiders we let our spider tell us when it wants to be fed and by by what i mean by that is when i come into the room i look for my spiders and if i see a spider's out and about when i put the lights on in the morning pretty much everybody is out and about the vast majority of them so they because this is because they're nocturnal in their general habitat you know in their general habits they're normally nocturnal so when we come in in the morning we flick the lights on everybody's out and about we've caught them really with their pants down they're all out wandering around doing their thing now when we come back later on in the day there will be a percentage of them spiders will still be out and they'll be hunting and they're waiting in ambush waiting for something to come along so we know that they're hungry so they are in actual fact telling us that they're hungry by the sheer fact that they are still out and about they might just be hanging on the edge of the burrow or on the edge of the bark if they're an arboreal they might well be sitting right outside it all depends on how comfortable they're feeling at the time and how hungry they are so by by looking at them we can tell straight away that we've got two or three spiders that are sitting outside they're hungry they're ready to go everyone else is hiding behind their their bark or they're in their burrows or whatever they're, they're meant to be doing so those spiders are letting us know they want food so then we can feed them spiders once we fed them they will disappear again we will still see them first thing in the morning where they've been coming out venturing around but they will go and retire back to bed pretty quick they don't hang around the ones that are hanging around are the ones that are looking for food so this is how we monitor how we're going to feed them with sorry my love yes so which is where we were going this is what we were saying next is with our adult spiders we let we allow them to tell us what's going on with our younger spiders we feed them on a more regimented um, approach so with these guys i go through the whole of the rack once a week normally on a weekend i will go through and i will check them all water them and i will feed them if necessary but the point is we've got say five spiders here they're all on the rack we can check them maybe only two of them spiders out of the five will need feeding maybe the other three as we've seen here so far are in pre-molt so do we feed them or do we leave them you know only you will tell when you start doing your spiders now i know for a fact that most of these are the stages that they're in these will still feed because they've got they have quite a time between changing that color to the pre-molt color 
getting ready for a molt. So they will still feed up until that point, but there is a point there where you will see that they will, they will refuse food. Now we can either look at that and look at the uh, abdomen on them. Normally it will go quite large and it will go quite shiny as well. Um, their color will get a much, much paler color. Um, another spider that's very prone for this is the stermies. Young stermies go very, very pale just prior to a molt. Baby stermies, like the, this sort of size. So there's all different things to look for. But with them, because we're feeding on a weekly basis, you will find that most of your spiders will come into molt at the same time. And often people say, oh, it must be the weather because I've just had a load of my spiders are all, all molting all together. Nine times out of 10, it's not the weather, it's down to the food. They've all been feeding on the same regular path because many keepers will feed their animals every week. Regardless of what's going on, they feed them every week. And the simple fact is your spiders don't need feeding every week. And we have found here, it can in actual fact be detrimental to feed them every week. So when they're babies, we maintain that constant food. As they get older, we spread it out more. And we found that we get a healthier spider at the end of it, especially our adults. Our adults benefit hugely from not being fed every week, you know? Allow them to get hungry and allow them to come out and look for food and things like that. And this also helps with breeding as well. In the wild cut state, these guys have not got food ad lib like they do here. So we try and change it around. Right, now this one again, this is another nice one, but this is in the early stages of pre-molt. Well, we can see it's brown, but we can also see there, the abdomen is really, really clean. This is a really lovely looking spider to be fair. Very, very nice. You see that nice and clear? Right. We're going to give it a little touch now and we'll see how it reacts. We're going to keep the edge of our pot right on the edge here. Now you notice we've come out and we're on this corner. And what we're doing is we're aiming the spider down into here. We want it to go in this direction. Should it come this way, it's not a problem, but we want it to go that way. So we're going to move that in there. Just touch it very gently. Mm -hmm. You see this one's holding his ground. So we're just going to move in, change the angle of the pot a little bit because you notice the substrate's moving with him. We don't want the whole lot to fall out. There we go. Oh, look at that. He actually looked like he had a little pop at the brush there. I think he was just trying to hide. So we're going to get him behind him. You see how he's moving his back legs now. Look, he's looking... He's thinking I'm going to have to do a runner in a minute. Here we go. We've maintained contact all the way through. Although we're rocking him, we've not left him. And you see how he's hanging on with his feet. He's got that one front leg there is holding on. He is hanging on for dear life. This is okay though. Here we go, see how now, look, he's feeling out, he's trying to find the ground. Nice and gently. You notice how we've not lost contact with him at all. There we go, he's let go. He's actually hanging on to a bit of substrate there, like a comfort blanket. There we go. There we are. Now we got him in there without too much hassle. And you can see what a beautiful spider he actually is. Now should we try and move this, this is where he'll probably liven up and disappear. So we're just gonna, you get a nice clear view of him. Bumping, yeah. yeah, maybe come around this way and we can see him. These really are very, very pretty spiders. Now you can see there, the red setter on the, on the abdomen there, absolutely beautiful. We can go right in close here, you get a lovely big close up there. You see the markings on the carapace there? Absolutely beautiful. And again, you see how the characteristic of holding the abdomen right up in the air. He is ready for action. In actual fact, 
if we go onto the side on and go as low as possible, you can see just the angle of that abdomen. That really is sticking directly upright, almost vertical. All right. So then what we're going to do now is we, we obviously want to get the lid on our spider. You can see there he's got a foot sitting on the edge of the thing. Now sometimes it's tempting to actually touch that foot because we don't want it on the edge. But that would be the wrong thing to do in this circumstance. So what we're going to do is we are going to get our lid, we're going to hold it flat and we're going to come down because the minute we touch him or he feels threatened, he will run. So what we're going to do is we are going to come down flat on top like this. We've now covered every exit. There you go. He's come off and he's just moved down a little bit. But by coming down on top like that, we've made sure that we've cut off every escape route. He had nowhere to go. Perfect. So sometimes if you just look at the situation that your spider's in and you work out a little plan of what you're going to do next, you can save yourself a whole lot of trouble. There's our label on. We're going to put this over the edge again, same as we did the others. Now this one's in even earlier stages, so this has got a little way to go. This, this guy here will definitely feed. So here he comes, he's coming out. You can see the colour difference. See how look at that, he's standing himself right up on his tiptoes, look at that. He's like, look at me, I'm huge. Look at that, amazing behaviour. He is making himself as large as he possibly can. You notice we've seen no aggression. This is all a visual display. This is all to make him look really, really big. And he's got his bum way up there, look at it. Look at that. It's like a loaded gun, that abdomen. Right, so what we're gonna do now, we want him to move over into the box. So we're gonna come down from above and we're gonna use the length of the brush against the length of the body we're just going to, we've made contact. So what we're doing is we're actually making him squat down a little bit. So he's a little bit smaller than he was trying to be. We're using the length there. You see how his legs are holding on? So we can come in there. We've unhooked them legs now. There we go. You know, so they're quite, they're quite stubborn, but then they have that habit of just taking off. You see how he changed then? Come on, mate, you've got a lovely new home. There we go, he's committed himself now. Look at that. Get some beautiful close-ups now, some real nice close-ups. You see the markings on the carapace there, just behind the eyes. Beautiful red... These red hairs go all the way down the legs, all the way through. You can see they're quite a hairy spider. And these are going to be a big spider as well. These guys are going to reach out at sort of seven inches easily. Very, very stunning. All right, so we're now, because we've stopped to have a look at him, if we'd maintain contact and movement, we would have carried on with the same feeling the spider would have felt exactly the same but because we've stopped now and we've let him have a little rest and we've had a look at him we are going to touch him again so he is going to see this as a brand new assault and there is the possibility that he might run away so we have to be very very careful now so what we're going to do is we are going to change the end of the brush we're going to use the brush now and we are just going to run down the side here down the side of the pot because all we want him to do is lift his foot off very gently. You see how we're lifting him? We're lifting him so, so gently. Now by maintaining that leg, you see how we're keeping a hold of that foot? And we are, we are literally guiding him where we want him to be. Yeah, 
So now we're happy, he's down where we want him. And all we do is we pull the brush away. There you go. Very nice. Well, you see that little jump there? All right, they're in. Right, well, that is our five Peter Sai, all nicely rehoused. They will go in these now and they will stay in here until they are probably, I would say we can probably get four malts or so off of them before they have to leave these pots. And then by the time they're ready to leave these, they will go into their forever homes. So if they end up, um, we sex them and they end up being males, then we will move them over and they will live in 20 by 20 by 20 cubes. If they turn out to be females, we will move them over to either 30 by 30 by 30 cubes, or we will give them some, some of the, um, like the rub boxes that we use as well, which are a little bit bigger. Um, it all depends on what we want to do with them. But as you saw there, there's some, if you see the way we handle them and the way we maintain contact with our brush, these are the most important things to, to try and watch. So now you've watched the video, go back and watch it again and you'll see, look at the way we use the brush on how we maintain contact and how we can use that as we demonstrated there on the last one, we can have literally one foot on the brush and we can dictate where we position that spider, where we want her to go. So it's really, really important. It's the finer points that make it all come together. So they're the things to watch out for. So we touched a little bit on the humidity. We're looking at sort of 60% to 70%. Absolutely fine for these guys. And we're also looking um, in terms of heat. These guys do like it warm. We have noticed that. We found before now where um, when we've had them on different racks, if they can feel the heat from our oil filled radiator, sometimes you will see them right up, just like Balfouri do. They climb up on the glass, trying to get the heat from the room. So these guys do like it really warm. So we've had them, uh, our room sits around about 80 degrees and we've had them higher than that and they're perfectly happy. One of these are one of the few spiders actually that when we had the heat wave, these guys were out sunbathing. They loved it. They really do like the warmth. So um, it's, a, it's a good thing to remember, especially when you're growing them on. A bit of warmth, these guys will grow really quickly. In terms of food, we are feeding these on um, half grown roaches or male dubias, they will take a male dubia, um, but there's no need to feed them anything too big. Keep them on the thing. We, we don't want these guys having to fight every time they have a meal. And this is something we see a lot of. People are very inclined to give them, to give their spiders very large food items. You do run the risk of your spider getting it injured. So we keep ours on the smaller side and just feed a little bit more regularly if it's young spiders. Um, if it's adult spiders, they're all capable of taking any adult roach. They'll do them no problem at all. So, well, hopefully this is gonna be a new breeding project. It's gonna take a little while in the making because the panther beaters do take a while to mature. Ideally, we're looking at females being probably three years old or more. Um, there is accounts of them breeding, machala and things like that, breeding at two, two and a half years. But I do believe with a lot of these big spiders, it pays to breed them older. I think we get a better response from them, um, and more success. I think it's not to say that a young one won't drop a sack, but I think it's just better for your spider as well to be not only um, size-wise mature, but sexually mature as well. They need to be bang on there. So I think we just about covered them now. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. And don't forget, be calm, be gentle, and love your spiders. And we will see you soon, guys.